Hello, Mr. Spokia, Pastor Norm Franz here. I just want to welcome you to this special expanded edition of the Elijah Report. We're going to be talking about prophecy in the news, which the news is just full of prophecy, especially in our political system. Um, you all know that we just came through uh, the fall feast. Uh, from Yom Teruah to Simchat Torah, we've gone through every single one of those and explained to you on the chart that I did last week um, exactly how they fall, the sequence and the timing of those events. And I just want to encourage you, if you didn't see uh, Saturday's um, service, the, the, the Torah study service for our Shabbat service, I really want to encourage you, go watch it on our YouTube because I lay it all out in there and then show you how at the end of the fall feast on Shamani Azarets, which is the last day, the great day of the feast, the eighth day, uh, the eighth day of uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, that that is when we sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb and, and Yeshua reveals the kingdom to us. He fills us to the fullness of his glory and then he sends us out into the nations on Simchat Torah to take and fill the whole earth with the knowledge of the glory of God. Hallelujah. And that's what the fall feast talk about. And I shared all of that in that, um, in that chart that I showed you last week. And just remember that the 30 minutes of silence in heaven in the book of Revelation is so all the end time prophecy teachers, including Pastor Norm can adjust his charts. And although I'm sure I'll have to adjust mine a little bit, um, I really think that this one is really, really close. Because, you know, God refines his understanding and his vision for us and for the future. Uh, the closer we get to those times, we're able to refine it. And so we have to make those whatever adjustments that we that we have to make. And you know me, I'm open to the adjustments. I just want them to be word-based and led by the Spirit. Amen. And so um, today, um, in this message today, I want to I want to start talking about the 2016 post-election review that I did on November 11th, 2016. And in that uh, comparison, everybody was comparing. Uh, Donald Trump to a Cyrus or, an, or a Nebuchadnezzar, and, and, and there are elements of both of them within um, that anointing that he seems to carry, especially the Cyrus anointing, that Cyrus model. Um, but I brought to the, to, the, to the floor, so to speak, um, that he was, that he was uh, as much like he was either one of those, he was like a Samson. And Samson, you remember, he went into the into the halls of the temple where everybody was at, and he went up and he and he pushed on both pillars and he brought down the building on top of everybody and wiped everybody out. Well, I likened that to Donald Trump as a Samson tearing down both the the Republican and the Democratic establishments and just brought it down on everybody. Everybody was going nuts, even many um, in the Republican Party. There's a lot of never Trumpers out there, but they're all establishment. They're all, quote, like Philistines, okay? And in, in, in the eyes of the Bible, in the eyes of believers, when they, when they take the Bible and they just kind of set it down on top of everything that's going on, um, the establishment is like the Philistines. It's the new world order globalists, and he's against globalism. And I'm not against globalism. I'm just against globalism under the God of this world. I am for globalism. I am for a new world order, but not the, not the new world order of, the, of globalism, the new world order of God. It, I call it a new God order because that's what he's bringing to this earth when he returns. And it will be international. It will be a global government that sits on the shoulders of Yeshua, according to the book of Isaiah. Hallelujah. And so that's what we have to, we have to be able to look past the things of this world and look to the things of the kingdom of God. And that's what I'm trying to help everybody do during this time. 
And so day, today I want to talk about, you know, voting biblically um, and explain to you why I'm not voting for Donald Trump. Now I'm going to let you catch your breath for just a minute, okay? Because I know that that just doesn't seem, you know, and everybody's, you know, they're just like tilt. And, but the bottom line is, is that if we vote for Donald Trump, then we're voting for the wrong, we're voting for the wrong reason for Donald Trump. We're voting for the wrong person. And, and, and I say that because um, we got a real wake up call here um, about a week and a half ago. Um, when, when Donald Trump got the coronavirus, um, you guys remember, uh, when he said during his inaugural address in January of, of 2017, he said the, one of the last things that he said in his speech, I'll never let you down. Well, when he said that, I thought, oh, President Trump, please understand you can't say that. Because the bottom line is, when he got when he got the coronavirus um, on the on the second of October, actually he got it on the first. He tweeted out uh, tonight, the first lady, and I tested positive for COVID nineteen, and and on the second there was a there was a breaking story in the AP that you know just said President Donald Trump has tested positive for the coronavirus. And although most of us that understand the prophetic purpose for Donald Trump being elected understood that he wasn't going to die because of the coronavirus. And we, you know, we talked about that last week and even maybe the, no, about last week. And, and the bottom line is this, is that, is that when God calls somebody to do a certain job, then the attacks that come on him that, that actually had been prophesied that there would be this type of an attack, a life-threatening attack. Um, we have to understand that when God says, nope, he's going to make it, he's going to pull through. Um, that means that he's going to make it and he's going to pull through. And so, and so when we embrace the way of God, we understand that, that, that he wasn't going to die of this. But the point that I want to make is this, is that James four, see, See, when he says, I'll never let you down, he, he's, he's really not even guaranteed tomorrow, honestly. James 4, verse 14 says, yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or do that. And the bottom line is, is that when when somebody says, I'll never let you down, you know, the bottom line is we can we could be dead tomorrow. And so could Donald Trump. I don't think he will because of all the prophetic words that have come forward. But we have to be careful to understand that Yeshua is the only one that will never let you down. He's the only one who will stand forever on his word and do what he said he was going to do. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. The scripture is very clear in Romans 10, 11, for the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. So the first thing I want to point out as we go into this is that who do we believe in? Are we, are we doing this based on our belief in Donald and our faith in Donald Trump? Or our faith in the word of God who put Donald Trump in there? That's really the key. And because of that, um, as I said, I am not voting for President Trump. And if you need a few seconds to catch your breath again, uh, just hang in there. You'll find out what I'm, what I'm talking about. I am voting for biblical principles and the Judeo-Christian ethics set forth in the Declaration of Independence. And that's governed by the U.S. Constitution and the Bill of Rights. This is, in the, in the bottom line, this is, uh, they put out there and they lay out what, what it is to have freedom under law, okay? Because both the Bible as well as our a Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights, they show and they, and they, and they mesh together perfectly how God establishes freedom under law. And if we work it the way that he puts 
uh, puts it in our hearts, put it in his word, and wants to put it and write it in our hearts and on our minds so that we can live it out, then everything will work out and we'll have peace on earth. But we know that man isn't interested in large part doing it God's way. He wants to do it his own way. And so I just want to do a little bit of a review as we go into this, as we go into this election, because if we don't understand this, which a lot of people, have, it's like they've forgotten their, their civics class. And they don't even, in many respects, they don't even teach civics in school uh, today. And that's really a shame. And it says this in the Declaration of Independence. At the top, it says, in Congress, July 4th, 1776, the unanimous declaration of the 13 states of, of America, it says, it goes on to say, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth, the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them. Now that's nature's God, not the God of nature. Big difference. It's a play on words sometimes, but we have to understand that the that nature's God, Yahweh, is not the God of nature, Gaia. Okay, you just have to. We we need to embrace that because that's what's trying to be shoved down our throat right now. It entitles them to a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the cause which impels them to the separation. And it's and then it goes on into the it goes on and it says and it says we hold these truths to be self evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And when you take the Bible and you lay it down on top of those three documents, what you see is God's plan for mankind, the government of mankind, to be able to operate in freedom under law. Because everything in these two, in these three documents, I should say, um, are based upon biblical principles. And so the first thing we have to understand coming out of this is that God has established in the Constitution, God has established the three branches of government. Isaiah 33 and verse 22 says this, the Lord is our judge, that's, who, that's our, our judicial system of which right now we are going through that confirmation process for a Supreme Court justice, okay? Um, it says, it goes on to say, the Lord is our lawgiver. That would be the legislative branch. And part of the one half of the legislative branch are the Senate, where those uh, judicial confirmation hearings are being held. And it says then the third thing is the Lord is our king. That's our executive branch. That's the one who provides for the common defense and so on and so forth. And, um, and then it says he will save us. In other words, God is all three of those branches and that's how he governs. And he has superimposed that onto the government of the United States in the constitution. And folks, we can't take that lightly because if we ever throw that off and the proper operation of that and the proper um, uh, deployment of that, so to speak, then, then we're, we're not going to make it. This thing will come down like a house of cards. And that's why God gave it to us the way that he did. So I'm not voting for Donald Trump. Here's what I'm voting for. Number one, I'm voting for the First Amendment, part one, the freedom of religion. The First Amendment says starts out saying this, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or... Now listen, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And our founding fathers understood this. Patrick Henry said this, it cannot be emphasized too strongly or often, or often that this great nation was founded not on religionists, but by Christians, not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. George Washington said this, it's impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. 
It's impossible to govern in a in a right way, in a righteous way, without God, without Yahweh of the Bible and his Bible, his word. And James Madison said this, we have staked the whole future of our political con uh, con constitutions upon the capacity of each of ourselves to govern ourselves according to the moral principles of the Ten Commandments. And there again, that just lays out the freedom under law. And the second thing I'm voting for is the I'm voting for the, 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 the First Amendment Part 2, Part 2 of the First Amendment. Um, freedom of speech, of the press, and the freedom to peaceably assemble. Article 1, after it says Congress shall make no law regarding religion, it goes on to say, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. And you have to understand that, that our press has in, in many respects been suppressed especially in social media. It's like, for example, the, the New York Times, I mean, a number of times, um, they have put op-eds out there that from, from conservatives that when they get some complaints from the left and all the other fake uh, media that's out there, they take the post down. They just take it down off their website or they'll write a retraction on behalf of the conservative that wrote the article. And, and you have to understand that is that's a censorship or they won't or they won't or they won't come and they won't allow someone on one side or the other, regardless, you know, they won't allow them to say anything. They won't allow them to give their opinion. People that go in to talk about certain things, especially on the conservative side, get shouted down by the left. They won't they won't let them talk. That is a form of censorship. According to a new poll by Pew Research Center, a majority of Americans on both sides of the political aisle believe that social media companies are censoring political viewpoints, and that's on both sides. And so you have to understand that the Constitution is being violated hand over fist. And, and I'm not saying that everything that somebody says, even a Christian, is right. What I'm saying is he has a right to say it, and then we have to study God's word to find out, well, is that really true or not? Or do I do I see it that way? Does do I feel like God sees it that way? And then we have a right to choose, legally choose one way or the other. And I think that's the important thing. It has to be legal. We have to come back to the laws of, of God and the laws of nature's God, that is Yahweh, and the Constitution and the other two documents. The right to peaceably assemble, not riot. And we see over here on the left, uh, Martin Luther King and a peaceful protest. And, and by that peaceful protest and, and, and his, his body, the, the, the African-Americans at that time suffered horrible things at the hands of the establishment. They were beaten and they, some of them were killed. But the bottom line is they didn't take up arms, they didn't riot, they didn't burn anything down. The bottom line is they got what they what they wanted. They got the right to vote. And from there, it's only the, the rights have only progressed. Now, is it perfect? No, it's not. I'm the first one to say that it's not. Personally, I don't understand bigotry. I'm I mean, I've never, I've never ever I, I love everybody. I mean, especially in the Lord, because we're all one in the Lord, no matter what color you are. Amen. And and but today now, um, you got Antifa and they're out there writing, wanting to pull down the establishment. And Antifa has taken over, has I should say, hadn't taken over, but they've infiltrated Black Lives Matter. And, and they've kind of drawn them in. And, and Antifa has been trying to give themselves legitimacy through Black Lives Matter. And you just have to understand, folks, is that that is something that, that, that in the end, that will suppress the, the, the speech of those who are conservative and want to maintain a constitutional republic in this, in this country. And that brings me to my next 
reason why I'm not voting for Donald Trump, because I'm voting to keep the Electoral College and preserve America as a constitutional republic. We have to understand that America is a constitutional republic, not a democracy. Here is a standard definition um, that, that I wrote based on other definitions out there. And it says this, constitutional republic, a political order in which the supreme power of a nation lies in its body of legal citizens who elect government representatives responsible to them, that's the elector, for passing and enforcing laws that follow the framework of their country's constitution. A democracy is a political order in which the country's laws and other government decisions are made predominantly by majority vote and do not always adhere to the nation's constitution. Now, most people that understand a constitutional republic and how it works call that mob rule. Because if you can get 51% of the people to vote for whatever, whether it follows the country's constitution or not, in a democracy, that's what that's what becomes law. And that's why our founding fathers, they, they understood that that just doesn't, that just, that won't work. In, fra- in fact, in, in, the, um, in the era of 1787, Lord Alfred Fraser Tyler said this, he said a democracy, and this is a standard quote by conservatives, uh, and it's true, a democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. It can only exist until the voters discover that they can vote themselves largesse, that's handouts basically, from the public treasury. From that moment on, the majority will always vote for the candidate promising the most benefits from the public treasury, with the result being that a democracy always collapses over loose fiscal policy, which is always followed by a dictatorship. And isn't that really in large part what's going on in Congress right now? They're, they're, they're fighting over a bailout package, or I shouldn't say a bailout package, a, an assisted package based on what, what COVID has done to the economy. And one side wants like $4 trillion. The other side wants under two. And, they, and it's targeted to you know what is actually needed, not all these other things. And, and, and the side that wants the of the big large S, we have to understand it's that's to get votes, you know, free health care, free uh, college, free this, free that. In other words, if you get a majority of people in a democracy to vote for all that stuff, that's what becomes law. But you see that in large part violates the Constitution. And so and so we have to come back and we, we need to vote for a constitutional republic, which is what our country is. Number four, the reason why I'm not voting for Donald Trump, because I'm voting uh, for protecting every unborn soul from being murdered through abortion. We have to understand that, you know, they say, well, it's not really life until the baby breathes. That's why they allow partial birth abortions. And I know this sounds gross, but if you you know what a partial birth abortion is, in, in large part, it's infanticide. And, and, and that's one of Rome's great big sins that they were doing just before Rome fell. That is a sign of a, of a um, I should say, that's an act of a country about to fail. And that's, what, and that's what so many people are trying to stop right now and vote against, come against. So as you see on day one, the 23 chromosomes from each parent come together and a new life begins. He or she is truly, it's a unique individual that is never going to be repeated. That life of that human being will never be repeated. Jeremiah 1, verse 5 says this, Before I, talking about God, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. And that's why when the New Testament says that we were in Messiah, we were in Christ before the foundation of the world. We have to understand, God God knew us before we were even created in our mother's womb. So tell me that's not a lie. 
if you if you're going to go from a biblical standard which which christian believers new, and well jewish believers because that's old testament that's the prophets that's jeremiah first chapter you're only five verses into it and he's already saying that and i knew jeremiah before before he was formed in his mother's womb okay well that's got to be a life doesn't it day 18 now listen to this this is really this is really this really takes it home okay day 18 the heart begins to beat with the baby's own blood well leviticus 17 11 says for the life of the flesh is in the blood so if the heart's beating pumping blood on the 18th day let me ask you from a biblical perspective is that a life the answer is yes absolutely so the bottom line is is that is that once that life is there in my opinion no one has the right to take it nine weeks fingerprints form wow look at this psalms 139 verse 13 says for you god yahweh form my inward parts you wove me in my mother's womb i will give thanks to you for i am fearfully and wonderfully made wonderful are your works and my soul knows it very well i want to tell you deep down in everybody's soul even those that don't believe in god they know that they were created deep down in their in their very very soul okay the bottom line is this is that i'm pro-life because yeshua is pro-life john 3 16 says this for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life for god did not send the son into the world to judge the world but that the world might be saved through him and so the bottom line is is that if god if if father god yahweh knew us before he even formed us a living soul in our mother's womb and yeshua jesus sacrificed his life to save every soul what right do we have to destroy the soul of an unborn baby through abortion the answer is we don't have any right to do that and that brings me to number five and i'm just i'm just throwing this out there you guys are going to have to decide on your own number five i'm not voting for donald trump because i'm voting for a, a, for appointing pro-life supreme court justices who are constitutional originalists a constitutional originalist is being interviewed right now in the in the confirmation hearings in the senate here's here's i'm going to draw the i'm going to draw the distinction between the two okay between the, the 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 different ways of looking at two major ways of looking at the constitution <clears throat> one in the context of united states law constitutional originalism is a concept regarding the interpretation of the u.s constitution it asserts that all statements in the constitution must be interpreted based on the original understanding of the authors or the people at the time it was ratified this concept views the constitution as stable from the time of enactment and that the meaning of its contents can be changed only by the steps set forth set out in article 5 constitutional originalists stand in contrast to the concept of a living constitution which asserts that the u.s constitution should be interpreted based on the context of current times even if such interpretation is different from the original interpretations of the document and so the bottom line is is that if you hold that view what good is the constitution and and the left the those that are trying to just do it the way whatever's going on right now okay say well yeah you're right we need to rewrite the constitution we need to have a constitutional convention and change the constitution well folks i want to tell you if that ever happens in this day and in this hour um the united the greatness of the united states will perish from the earth and there's no question about that 
the meaning of the Constitution here here here's here's what I believe the meaning of the Constitution is static in other words it's, it's fixed therefore in an originalist interpretation any ex post facto information such as opinions of the American people American judges or the judiciary of any foreign country is inherently valueless for interpretation of the meaning of the Constitution and should not, and I want to emphasize, should not form any part of constitutional jurisprudence. In other words, you can't bring my opinion, your opinion, judges' opinions, or foreign governments, the judges, the judgment of foreign governments. That's why that's why we're not bound by, that's why we don't want to bind ourselves to treaties, international treaties, okay, unless we sign on. Those treaties are no good here unless we sign on. And the bottom line is, it's because we have a constitution that preserves our rights, the right of everyone. And, and, if, we, and if we say that, well, it's based on, we're going to interpret it based on the, the morals and, the, and everything of the day, I want to tell you what, it's, it's then the Constitution is just, it's null and void. It's no longer fixed. Here's my point. Originalists follow the pattern that God does not change. Malachi 3, 6 says, for I am Yahweh, I do not change. Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ, God, in the, God who came in the flesh, Yahweh in the flesh, is the same yesterday and today and forever. In other words, he doesn't change. He says that heaven and earth are going to pass away before one jot or tittle of my Torah passes away until all is fulfilled. Hallelujah. And we have to, we have to get a grip on that, folks. God does not change. And because the Constitution was based on the biblical principles, okay, then part of that biblical principle, part of those biblical principles is that it doesn't change. It's static. It's fixed. Our, our founding fathers were absolute geniuses when it comes to this. Proverbs 24, beginning in verse 21, says this, My son, fear the Lord and the king. And then it says, do not associate with those who are given to change, for their calamity will rise suddenly. And who knows the ruin that comes from both of them. And so what I want to do is I want to encourage you so much in my heart to help you understand that if we give to change of our Constitution, just interpreted based on the times which will change the original context of the Constitution, then you must understand calamity will arise in this country and it will happen suddenly and and we can't even imagine the ruin that is going to come as a result of it and that's why we have to go back to the process the u.s judicial process is based on the torah of moses on the laws of the written laws of god that he gave to moses Number one, the formal structure is in Exodus 18. Number two, the general guidelines for the judges are in Exodus 21 through 23. Number three, the, the plea for fair and equitable judgment is in Deuteronomy 6, 18 through 20. Number four, the need for investigation and the testimony of two or three reliable witnesses and cross-examination are in Deuteronomy 19, verses 18 through 20. And a judicial appeal system, are like the appellate courts, that's all laid out in Deuteronomy 17, verses 8 through 11. And God's Torah is portrayed in the Supreme Court architecture. And you can see some of those pictures here. And I talked about that in a biblical response to the New World Order. In Congress, July 4th, 1776 when it says this we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights that among them are life liberty and the pursuit of happiness i say pro-life i'm talking about pro pro-life judges supreme court judges i say that because abortion 
denies the unborn who is alive the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If you take that life, there is no life. There is no liberty, and there is no pursuit of happiness. And so that's why I believe that judges need to be pro-life. If judges had been pro-life when all of that, when Roe versus Wade came, came up before the Supreme Court, please hear me, we would not have a Roe versus Wade. We would not have had that, that, that decision that allows for not only the free, not only uh, an abortion, a legal abortion, but that the government, your taxes and my taxes, will help pay for it. And we must understand that's as ungodly as a thing can get, okay? The sixth reason I'm not voting for Donald Trump is because I'm voting for a well-trained police force to maintain law and order on the streets. And I'm voting for a well-trained, multi-ethnic police force to maintain law and order on our streets. Not a multinational, not a multiracial, because there's only one race, okay? I'm looking for the standard that was established in our Constitution for a multi-ethnic police force to maintain law and order in our streets. Romans 13 and 1 says this, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Like it or not, folks, that's the scriptures. And we're talking about civil authorities now. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinances of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. And all of those who are resisting and are out there rioting, you have to understand they're going right up against what God's word says. And that means that they are resisting or going against God himself. And now more and more of them are getting arrested and thrown in jail. That's part of the judgment that they have brought upon themselves. Okay. Verse three, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be uh, uh, unafraid of the authority do what is good and you will have praise from the same now i understand there are bad bigoted cops out there who take advantage and and will use race as a as a as a, as a reason to to over police let's put it that way but the large large majority of police out there are simply about maintaining law and order. They don't want controversy. They don't want confrontation any more than anybody else does. And that's why if we, if we as a people walk in the laws of the land and the, the scriptures, according to scripture, guess what? We're going to have peace. You know, the number one law of God is do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. So a bigoted cop, that takes advantage and over polices, then guess what? That's 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 not treating others the way that he would want to be treated. And rioting and burning buildings and businesses and so on and so forth of our own ethnic body that we're supposed to that that are that they're supposed to be standing up for. You just have to understand that's not that's not you know, following the golden rule of doing unto others as you'd have them do unto you. So the bottom line is there's plenty of blame to go around, and that's why God's people have to have to lead back to the way of God. Verse 4 says, For he is God's minister to you for good. He's there to maintain law and order. If we don't have law, if we don't have civil government, folks, then what we're gonna have is we're gonna have exactly what we've seen. In Seattle and Portland, uh, in Chicago, and so on and so forth. That's exactly what's going to happen, and that's why civil authority is there is to maintain law and order, because he's there to minister to us for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. In other words, you're going to get thrown in jail, or he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister. An avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. In other words, in other words, criminal criminals are gonna see the wrath of the of law enforcement come down on them. 
Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. There's two good reasons. Because if we aren't, if we aren't walking according to the laws of the land, then the wrath of law enforcement is going to come down on us. And, and you must understand that the people that do wrong, they know they're doing wrong. And there's the, and, but they don't have a conscience in many respects. If they get caught, they do a lot of times. But the bottom line is, is that, is that it's for conscience sake. It's for our own sake that we do that. And that brings me to the seventh reason I'm not voting for Donald Trump, uh, President Trump, is because I'm voting for secure borders, border security and national security. I'm voting for secure borders because God, that's the standard of God. God set the boundaries of the earth and its season. Psalm 74, verse 17 says this, you, God, have established all the boundaries of the earth. You have made summer and winter. And we must understand is that God set the boundaries of creation. He set the boundaries of the earth. He set the boundaries of the sky, separating those from outer space. He set the boundaries of the waters so that we would have water in some places and have land in other places. And within that creation, within all of those different boundaries, God set the boundaries of the seasons, the winter, spring, summer, and fall. And the scripture is very clear that God did all this. This is the pattern of God. God also set the boundaries of the nations, the ethnos. Acts 17, verse 26 says this. He made from every, from one man, every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. Now, let me stop there for just a minute and explain. Is that there's only, as I've said before, there's only one race, mankind. He made from one man, Adam, the, 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 the first individual of mankind. Every nation. In other words, he... He, he, out of Adam, one, one race of mankind, he developed a lot of different ethnic groups who all have an ethnic culture that they have a right to express. And if we can get past the whole race war type of thing and understand that we're dealing with different ethnic uh, groups and cultures, then the bottom line is this is that we'll live, we'll be able to live in peace and we will be truly tolerant of one another, right, wrong, or indifferent. Doesn't make any difference. Is that is that we need to deal with the ethnic status of people and, and honor their ethnic status and, and, and allow them to live and let live as long as they don't violate the life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness of others and live within the laws of the land according to the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, okay, and the Bible. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. It goes on to say, having determined, now this is really a key, a key um, uh, point here when it comes to boundaries. Having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. In other words, all the nations, the boundaries of the nations that you kind of see highlighted here in this overhead, you have to understand God created all of them for for their for their times and the those inhabit that to inhabit those boundaries during this time. God did that, not man. God did it. Did he work through man? Did he work through different groups? Yes, absolutely. But God's the one who did it. And the thing that I always the thing that I always enjoy. <laughs> Is reminding people is that God set the boundaries of the nations according to the number of the sons of Israel. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 8 says, When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of men, he set, now listen to this, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel. That's one of the reasons why God took the this, took this census uh, early on in Israel when they were in the wilderness. And you see the numbers right here on this overhead. God did that. 
He's the one who set the boundaries of the people of the of the earth according to the number of the sons of Israel. And I've pointed this out before, and I'll just do it briefly here, is that every nation that has come against Israel has gone from a huge, huge, huge empire, including, including England and Russia, down to what? You know, just, I mean, just think about it, folks. If you know your history, I don't have time to explain all that, but you can figure that out. They've all come against Israel in some form, fashion, or another, and the minute they did, began their demise. God set the boundaries of the promised land. Genesis 15, verse 18, beginning in verse 18, says this. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying to you and your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. And there is the, there's the original land grant of the promised land. Within that, God gave the boundaries of Canaan. Because when, when Israel came in under Joshua, came into the land, here's what, here's what the Lord, um, through Moses, before they went in, uh, told them. It says, then, then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command the sons of Israel and say to them, When you enter the land of Canaan, this is the land you sh that shall fall you as an inheritance, even the land of Canaan according to its borders. And the borders of Canaan are laid out in Genesis, and I put them there on the map of the promised land. I call it the lesser promised land. And God set the boundaries of modern-day Israel today when he started, when he restored them in 1948 under Resolution 181, and those boundaries have only expanded. And the more the, 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 the Arab people and, the, and the, especially the radical Islamists come against Israel and try to destroy Israel and drive them into the sea or go back to the 67 borders, you must understand the more Israel will expand. Because they're so unrighteous, is that why? No, it's because God has said he would restore them back to their land in the last days. So if you're fighting Israel, and them coming back into the land and, and inhabiting the, the, the promised land of Canaan, please understand, you're not going up against Israel. You're not even going up against the United States that supports that. You're going up against God himself. And I just have to tell you, there's, there, there's right and there's wrong, but there's right in God's eyes and the way God is doing things versus the, the, the things that the world thinks are right because those are diametrically opposed. Amen? They are. And, and believers have to get on the right side, <clears throat> on the side of righteousness with the Lord. And I explain all of that. I go through all of that. I show you the maps and scripture upon scripture upon scripture, who the land passed to. Did it pass to Isaac or did it pass to Ishmael? What does the scripture say? I go through all of that in the promised land of Israel, past, present, and future. And if you don't have that, and I've got all the charts, all the PowerPoint maps, and so on and so forth in there, all the scripture verses, so that you can you can take that and you can use that to help educate people on why we need to support Israel, and that the minute that we don't, the, the, the United States will lose its borders, and it will lose its land, portions of its land, to the degree that we promote the, the dividing up of Israel, okay? I don't have time to go into all of that. You can just get the, the, the teaching and, and um, listen to it yourself. I'm voting for secure borders, borders for the United States because God set the boundaries between the United States and Mexico, just as an example, okay? Acts 17, 21 comes back to every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and boundaries of their habitation. God, God appointed America's boundaries, and that runs along the border, and, we're, and we have the right to secure borders. There's nothing wrong with that. God even gives boundary lines for our property. Does everybody understand? You know that we're building a new facility, and um, 
and I'm in the process right now of working with our uh, the, the place right next to us to build a fence between us. And he came to me and I and I I agree. I said, yeah, we need we need a fence that, you know, the old saying that good fences make good neighbors and they do. Deuteronomy 27 even points this out, that if you move the boundary line, you're cursed. Look at this, verse 17. Cursed is he who moves his neighbor's boundary mark, and all the people say amen. In other words, the boundary between, between governments, between countries, between individuals are set by God. And we have to realize that the globalists, they just, they don't want any borders, just one big happy family. See, that's the new world order of globalism that will ultimately fall under, under the rule of one demonically possessed man. That's what's coming. And having boundaries, we must understand, is the pattern of heaven. Revelation 21 and verse 12 says this. Also, the city, talking about the city, the new Jerusalem, had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates and names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. In other words, heaven has a border wall with gates and a clearly defined immigration policy. I think that's really important. Everyone is welcome, but you must come in legally. Amen. <laughs> you must be born again we can't get in if we aren't born again thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven everyone's welcome you must be born again to get in legally okay that is an awesome awesome thing to think about that is the pattern of heaven having no boundaries is the pattern of hell Proverbs 27 says this, beginning in verse 20, says, Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. In other words, hell's gates are wide and open to anyone who wants to go in. There is no qualification. So which gate have you chosen? The gate of hell? Matthew 7, verse 13 says this, For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. Or have you chosen the kingdom of heaven? Verse 14 goes on to say, For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. And boy, I tell you, is that true or what? Are we born again? How many of you believe there's more people that are not born again out there that are on their way, according to scripture, you don't make the kingdom of heaven. There's only other one place to go. Those who are born again are going to make it to the kingdom of heaven. That way is narrow. That way, you must understand this truth, God is, is bearing down on this truth. This truth is closer today in, in our lifetimes for on, on to culminating than it ever has been. In other words, I'm voting for good over evil in the end. I'm voting for good over evil. Part of that is, is that I'm voting for a strong military that keeps America and the world free and, and, and to support our veterans. We, the people of the United States, in order to perform a more perfect union, this is in the Constitution, ensure domestic tranquility. Now listen to this. Provide for the common defense. Promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. That's our offspring. Do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. And a, and a military to provide for the common defense, as well as our police forces, our local police forces, state and local police forces, are to provide for the common defense of the people and to promote the general welfare of it. I also 
vote to support our men and women in uniform, past, present, and future. God bless you, and thank you for your service. Without you, we would not have the freedoms that we have today. In fact, without you, in World War II, we probably would have ended up everybody speaking German. Yeah, under a fascist system. Communist, dictatorship, one, one of those aspects of it. And that's where we don't want to go. That's why we have to maintain our constitution. That brings me to, I'm voting for policy versus personality. I know some of you are saying, well, I just don't, like, even Christians are saying, well, I just don't like his attitude. I don't like his tweet, so I'm not going to vote for him. I'm going to vote for, for, for Joe Biden. You don't like his personality? Give me a break. Get over it. You know, there's a lot of people's personality I don't like. I don't like some of the stuff that uh, President Trump says or the way he says it or the way he tweets it either. But that has nothing to do with anything. It has to do with, the, with the, 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 the policies that he's promoting. In the end, his personality isn't going to make or break this country. It's the policies that he, that he uh, passes and gets, and gets into legislation and enforces and brings about and brings back in many respects. Because if we move away from that because we don't like his personality, my goodness, come on, church, wake up. And you say, well, he needs to be nicer. Well, you know what? If he was nicer, he'd be just like every other politician. He'd have made all the promises that they made, which is largely what he said he would do, but he's doing them. In fact, you know, I'm 67 years old, and I've voted in every election since I was 18 years old. And he is the first politician that said, I'm going to do this, 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 and this, and I, and, I, and I won't let you down. And in those areas, and for the most part, he has not let me down. He has gone out and he has done almost everything that he has promised. He's, he's the only one I, that I can remember that ever did that. And the fact that he's offending the establishment, he's not doing it the way of the establishment, he's not as poised or as graceful as the establishment, please hear me, if he was that, he wouldn't get done what he's doing. That's what this country needed was a hard-nosed New York real estate developer that either you do the job or you're fired. And the bottom line is that's, that's what has brought this country back in large part. And so Christians, you need to, you need to throw off the, the issue you might have with his personality or the way he does things. And you said, well, God would never call a man like that who, who and some people don't believe he's, he's, he's a Christian. Some people believe he's had a born again experience. It's immaterial. Just think about Cyrus. I told you I was going to come back to Cyrus later on. Okay, well, here we are. Think about Cyrus and how God used a pagan king. Go to Isaiah 45. Let's read in verse 1. It says this. Thus says Yahweh to Cyrus, his anointed. He calls Cyrus a pagan king of Persia. He calls him his anointed. In other words, God anointed a pagan king whom I, Yahweh, have taken by the right hand to subdue nations before him and to loose the loins of kings to open doors before him so that, so that gates will not be shut. In other, words, in other words, God is saying, Yahweh is saying, I'm raising up Cyrus, a pagan king, as my anointed, and I'm going to go before him to subdue nations and open up gates that will not be shut. Can God do that? Yeah, to accomplish his purposes, you bet he can. And I believe that the prayers of the, of the Christian church have ascended and God has heard. And so he sent like a Donald Trump, okay, to come in. How many of you know, you probably wouldn't have liked uh, Cyrus's personality either or the way that he did some things. The bottom line is, folks, is that God has a purpose for everything, and that's why we need to get away from personality 
and back to policy. Verse 2, Isaiah 45, 2 goes on to say this. I will go before you and make the rough places smooth. I will shatter the doors of bronze and cut through their iron bars. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, the is and Israel, my chosen, I have all I have also called you by your name. I have given you a title of honor, though you have not known me. Very clearly, Cyrus did not know the Lord. I mean, and in that knowing, that means that he knew him, believed in him, in in the in the essence of following his ways. Verse 5 says, I am the Lord, and there is no other besides me. There is no God. I will gird you, Cyrus, though you have not known me. Yeah, says it again. Now let's go over to Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 36. Let's read here. It says, Now in the first year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah. Jeremiah, remember, prophesied that Israel would go into 70 years of captivity to Babylon. And that's exactly what happened. But he said that after 70 years, that they would come back to the land of Israel and rebuild the temple. Well, guess what? 70 years later, um, uh, well, a little bit before 70 years, Cyrus of Persia rose up and conquered Belshazzar of Babylon. That was the offspring of, of Nebuchadnezzar. And then God moved on Cyrus, called him his servant, anointed him. In fact, God gave him, because God raises up and God tears down kings and kingdoms. He raised up Cyrus to tear down Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. And then in that, he was he anointed Cyrus to release the Jews to go back to Israel. Look at this. In order to fulfill the words, the, the, the word of the Lord through the mouth of Jeremiah, that they would go into 70 years of captivity, but after that, they'd be sent back. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. Yeah, the Lord stirred him up. I believe that that before John, that before Trump was president, God stirred him up to become president. Because God had a plan for Trump because Trump's the only one that could do what Donald Trump's doing. Honest, he's the only one. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. So that he sent a, a, a proclamation throughout his kingdom and also put it in writing saying this. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, talking about Yahweh, the God of heaven, the, the Lord, the God of heaven that Cyrus did not know, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He understood who, who the power was. He didn't know him. He didn't really follow him. It says, and he has, a, has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you of all the peoples, may the Lord his God be with him and let him go up. See, I, I have to tell you, I'm not voting for Donald Trump. I'm not voting for just myself. I'm voting for the future of America based on the policies. I'm voting for the wisdom of God to govern over the foolishness of this earth, this world, this world system. 1 Corinthians 3.19 says, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. So I'm voting for the wisdom of God over the foolishness of this world. Yeah. See their wisdom? They say what their wisdom is? God says that's foolishness. Where's God's wisdom? Where can we find a measure, a, a large measure of God's wisdom? Good question. I'm so glad you asked. Ecclesiastes 10, 2 says this. A wise man's heart turns him toward the right, which is the way of blessing, the way of righteousness. This is the Amplified Bible now. But a fool's heart turns him toward the left, which is the way of condemnation. And you must understand that God condemns, and the word of God condemns the way of the left. So I'm voting for the wisdom of God to govern over the foolishness of this world. I'm voting for the candidate with the most Bible-based, right-leaning, conservative platform who can win the election. And so the question is, who will you vote for? 
Are you going to vote for the wisdom of the right or the foolishness of the left? Are you going to vote for the wisdom that is in the right-leaning conservative platform or the foolish platform of the left-leaning liberal? And the bottom line is, folks, is that we the only way this country will survive is that if we vote in righteousness, the right way versus the way of condemnation, because in the end, the country that goes to the left and and um, South America, Venezuela is the is the latest country that has gone left. And you see the condemnation that is there and the chaos that is there and socialism and ultimately communism came in there and supported them. Uh, the Russians and the Chinese both came in and supported uh, Venezuela. You must understand and what they were doing. You've got the chaos that, 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 that is the most chaos I've seen in a while. And the bottom line is, folks, is that if, if we go left, if we don't vote for righteousness, then that's the way this country will go. In fact, that's the way the whole world will go. Because as the U.S. goes, so goes in large part, so goes the world. Like it or not, that's the way that it is. And so I just want to encourage you, when you go to the voting booth, take your, take your scriptures and take your constitution, your bill of rights, and the, and, the, um, and the declaration of independence and take that in knowledge and go into that voting booth. And that's how I want to encourage you to vote because I'm not voting for Donald Trump. I'm voting for the conservative, righteous, right way policies that he represents. And I just thank you for joining me and, and uh, staying as long as you did. I pray this was a blessing to you. I pray it will help you as you vote uh, in November. God bless you and shalom.